A couple of weeks ago, we began a new series uh, for just a couple of weeks out of John chapter three and four. And uh, we focused uh, kind of as a starting off, a jumping off point uh, in a Greek word uh, that's uh, dei, D-E-I, um, and it is typically translated as must. It, it's an imperative as something that has to be done. And uh, we talked two weeks ago about sort of the must of the sinner, if you will, in, in the beginning of John 3 and verse um, 7, where Jesus said, you must be born again. And then Cole talked last week about the must of the Savior, uh, where Jesus talked about the Son of Man must be lifted up. And this morning, we're going to look at, at the must of the servant. And we see this, uh, uh, this interaction that takes place between John the Baptist and his disciples, his followers. And we're going to focus on verse 30, John chapter 3 and verse 30, where it says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And we want to look at uh, this passage this morning. We begin in John chapter 3 and verse 26. And the background on that is that Jesus has finished this discourse, this conversation with Nicodemus. And the Bible says that Jesus is down in Judea and, and him and his disciples are baptizing people. He's teaching and preaching there. Judea was south. It was near the Dead Sea. That's where Jesus was. John and his followers were up between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea along the Jordan River. Now, we don't know exactly where in Judea Jesus was, but they were probably separated by 30 to 50 miles. And there be, arises this conflict, this discrepancy between the followers of John and some of the uh, Jewish leaders about, uh, say, about cleansing and about uh, some of the processes of cleansing that they went through. And then John's followers come to John in chapter, in verse 26, and they said this. They came to John, they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, talking about Jesus, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, hear, hears, him, hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John's followers come to him and they're, they're kind of upset. They're worried because they said, listen, we're following you. You are the guy who's drawn great crowds. You are the guy who's, who's, who's stirred up the whole country with your message of repentance. You've been baptizing people with the baptism of repentance. I mean, people, you're, you're famous across the country. And now this guy who you baptized, he's taken your gig. He's doing what you were doing. He's preaching and teaching. His disciples are baptizing. And now people are starting to come to him. He's, he's infringing on your turf. He's, he's taking what you did and he's copying it. And he's having some success. They were upset. Now from our perspective, we understand who John the Baptist was, that he was divinely appointed to be the forerunner, the announcer of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we understand who Jesus is. This sort of seems like an absurd complaint for the followers of John to have. But from their perspective, man, they had put in with John. This guy had been stirring up the country they were following him and now somebody else was kind of usurping that authority. Can you imagine people getting jealous over things that the Lord is blessing? Thank God that doesn't happen today, amen? 
I mean, thank goodness we are mature. We've evolved to the point where we would never get jealous over somebody else. Listen, I'm on an email list with a bunch of pastors. At times, it's like being on an email list with kindergartners, except for they know theological terms. It is unbelievable. I'm just telling you, it is unbelievable. The, the, it's unbelievable. It makes some political commentary that I see on social media look tame by comparison sometimes. It's horrible. And it's not just pastors. It's not just ministers. I mean, we do it all the time over all kinds of things. You ever, you ever had somebody be blessed and you wanted them to be blessed, but then there was a part of you that was just jealous about that too? I have. I mean, I've been like, God bless you. But why didn't he bless me? And these guys come to John with this distress. And John says this, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Listen, we're gonna get to verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. But I think it's important that we understand who said it, John the Baptist, why he said it, and what his mindset was. Because in our lives, our goal should be for us to decrease and for Christ to increase. But to emulate that, we can learn some things from John. John was a guy who he preached in the desert. He didn't exactly use the greatest techniques. Now, if I was a preacher, a prophet, or a teacher, I would go to the center of the city, right? I would go to the square, the market, where everybody was gathered around and begin to proclaim, you know, pearls of wisdom. But that's not what John did. John preached in the desert where nobody was. And yet crowds began to come to him, hundreds of people, then thousands of people, to see this guy, this guy who wore kind of crazy clothes and, 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 and I think John probably just had an odd look about him. You know, when I picture John, I picture that kind of um, preacher slash Unabomber look. You know what I'm saying? Where his beard's sticking out and his hair's sticking out. He's wearing camel hair with a leather strap around it. This guy eats bugs and honey. That's his diet. And he's like, and I don't really think of John as like sitting down with his hands folded. I think this guy's up and in your face. Now that may not be true. But the description that we get in scripture is pretty close to that. And this guy, he's not preaching a message that, would, that you would think would draw a bunch of people. He's not saying, hey, God loves you and God cares about you. He did proclaim the love of God, but he said, you need to repent. You guys are snakes and vipers and sinners and you need to repent. And, and he was in your face and people were coming. But that message was not born out of arrogance or pride. John was a humble servant of God. He said, listen, nobody can do anything except for it comes from heaven. He's got to increase. I've got to become less. Proverbs says this about humility. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Better, listen to verse 19. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Look at verse 19. You are, this is Proverbs, compiled by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, inspired by the Holy Spirit, preserved by God's providence for us today. This is God's word to you. It's God's word to me. And God's word to you says, it is better to be humble with the lowly then divide the spoil. What's dividing the spoil? 
That was the result of victory. In a battle, when they would fight somebody, they would defeat a city, they would take out all their treasure. That was the spoil. And then they would divide it up. That sounds like something I would like. The fruits of victory. You're better to be humble with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. That is what God thinks about pride and humility. That gives you some insight into how seriously God takes the attitude of our heart as it relates to this thing of pride. We know that, oh, pride goes before a fall. So I don't want to get too prideful, but you know what? Given the chance to divide the spoil, aren't we always right in the middle of that? But Proverbs says you're better to be with the lowly because we need to understand where our blessings come from. We're gonna talk about this this morning, about who our provider is and who we are in Jesus Christ. James says this in verse, uh, chapter one, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You know what the problem is with mankind? What the problem is with us is God has set up this world to use us as his tools and his instruments. And I was thinking about that in relationship to James chapter one. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights. So I was thinking about, well, what, what good and perfect gifts do I think about in my life? So a lot of things, right? Like I think about relationships that I have, the family that God has given me, and I play a part in that. Right, I mean, I met my wife, we fell in love, we got married, we had children. I was there, I had played a part in that. But I have to understand that those things are blessings from God. God used me, I was a tool for God's work, but that is God's work. And when I start looking at my family and I think, I did that, then I'm putting myself in the place of God. I think about it in relationship to the creation around us. I love living in Colorado. I love to go to the mountains. I love to be outside. Yesterday I did what I do, or I've done the last two or three Saturdays now. I mow my lawn. I love summer, but I, I could, you know, I, I could go with that artificial turf, I think. Um, but I do enjoy mowing the lawn. So I get the lawn all mowed. Get everything blowed off, trimmed up. And it was kind of raining off and on as I'm trying to get the lawn mowed yesterday. But then it was, it was that kind of cool time where it's the evening and there's some dark clouds, but the sun's getting through there and my grass is still green and I haven't even turned on the sprinkler system yet. And I'm just looking across my grass and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I don't know who Scott is, but he doesn't have anything on what I got going on. I mean, I'm just, I'm feeling good, right? You know how much grass I can make grow by my will? Because there's one who created the grass and created the dirt and created the sun to shine on it and brings rain to water it. And you know what I do? I drive around on a lawnmower and cut it and think I'm something. And that you say, well, that's just kind of a goofy illustration, preacher. It is, but it's sort of indicative about how we are about every part of our life if we're not careful, because we can think we're something. We can think we're building something, we're doing something, we're creating something. When if anything that we have created or built, if we've had a part in any of that, it is simply as a tool from the one from whom everything good and perfect comes down. And so we just need to understand who supplies. It is not us. It is the provider. 
It, as, as followers of Jesus, and we're going to talk about this a little more when we talk about who we are, it's not that we have some kind of false sense of humility, like, well, I can't do anything. I no, it's just understanding the, where we, where we kind of are in the hierarchy. Listen, I, I'm happy that God uses me. God, God uses, God desires to use all of us. That's not a prideful statement. I'm thankful for the things that God has given to me, but I need to understand that those are gifts from God. Psalm 24 and verse one says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Romans will not take the time to look at it, but it says that even us, we are the Lord's. And so John responds to his followers by saying, listen, nobody can do anything except for it comes from God. And then he says this in verse 28 of John chapter three, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. John said, listen, I've always said I'm not the Messiah. That's always been my message. My message has always been, it's not me. It's not about me. It's about the one who's coming after me. So you shouldn't be shocked, surprised, or concerned that the one who is coming after me is garnering greater attention, greater crowds. He's preaching with greater authority. Why? Because he's the one I was sent to, to proclaim anyway. This was absolutely God's plan. And then in verse 29, he gives us this illustration, this analogy of the friend of the bridegroom. We talked about this. I went back and looked in my notes. I preached uh, over part of this passage about two and a half years ago. So I know some of you guys are like, oh yeah, I'm I remembering that. Um, it's okay, I forgot too. But especially in that day, they would have the friend of the bridegroom. It, it would be like our best man today. Now, if you've been to a wedding or you've been a, a, a groomsman or um, a, a best man, you know, a groomsman in general has like zero responsibility. I mean, you just got to stand up there in the right order and maybe you've got to escort one of the bridesmaids. The best man, he has traditionally in our society a few responsibilities, right? Maybe, maybe he holds on to the ring. Although depending on your best man, you may or may not trust your best man with the ring, you know? You might be like, well, here, just pretend you've got the ring, but I'll really keep a hold of it. I've said this before, but I'll never forget standing in the back of the church. Uh, we were in East Texas where my wife is from and I was getting married. And uh, we walked around and out this side door. We're standing right at the front. We're looking at the back, anticipating the bridesmaids coming in. And then of course, my bride, my buddy, my best man, my best friend since middle school puts his arm around me and leans in and whispers in my ear and says, we can get out of here right now, man. I got a full tank of gas and the car's right out back. <laughs> and I said, stop it, I'm trying to get married. And I'm like 49, 51 at this point, so just, not really. He did say that, he's a jerk. But anyway, um, I got him back later. But in the Jewish society, the bridegroom had, or the, the friend of the bride, the best man, he had some serious responsibilities. They would, they would throw a big party and, and the, the best man, the friend of the bridegroom was responsible, had some responsibilities within that party. He had some responsibilities in going to get the bride. He had some responsibilities in helping set up the house, uh, the, the, the groom's house uh, for the uh, marriage to come, but he had a big responsibility because at some point during the party, the bride would leave and she would go to the chamber that had been prepared for the wedding night. 
Now, evening and night would come, it would be dark, and again, you have to think about the culture in which this was. They have torches, they have lanterns, they have candles, but it's certainly not light like we think of it. And the, the bride is there in the chamber, and the best man, the friend of the bridegroom, would stand outside the chamber, and his job was to guard it until the groom came. And when he heard the voice of his friend, because he's the best man, he's the friend of the groom, he knows his voice. And when he hears his voice, he knows that his responsibility is over and that the groom is coming to take his bride and that they're, they're gonna enjoy their wedding night. And he is joyful at the coming of the groom. And John said, as the friend of the bridegroom, I rejoice when I hear his voice. And then John said, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Notice that verse 30 is, two, it has two parts to it. There is an increasing and a decreasing. It's not that God must increase and with it, I'm increasing too. But it's in my life, in order for Christ to fill more of me, in order for Christ to be a greater part of me, then my flesh, my desires have to be less. Second Corinthians puts it this way. Second Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 17, says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here's what I want you to see out of this passage of scripture. See who we are in Christ. Listen, when we're talking about having a heart of humility and we're talking about decreasing, those things are, are a function of, of the spirit and the flesh in our lives, but it's not that God is seeking to push us down and keep us down. We need to understand who we are in Christ. If first, second Corinthians says we are a new creation. It says we have become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus. You understand that in Christ, we are somebody in Christ. We are much more than we could ever be on our own. In Christ, we are, uh, we're joint heirs with God. Romans 8, 14 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba or daddy. Abba is the most intimate fatherly phrase that you could get, right? If my, if my kids come to me, you know, and they might refer to their father. But when my, especially my daughters, when they want something, they'll say, daddy. <laughs> now my son, he just calls me all kinds of names, but my, my girls. I, I get to church pretty early on Sunday. I leave my house before my wife or my daughter wake up. So I don't see them in the morning. I come here and I'm busy preparing. And I've trained my daughter that when she comes to church, she needs to find me. Because I would like a, a hug from her. And most Sundays, she'll come find me and she'll say, Dad. And I know she's sucking up. 
And I know she's just doing that because I've trained her to do it. And, but you know what? I don't care. This is the picture that is painted here in scripture between us and God. God didn't save you to put you in bondage. He saved you to free you. He said, you don't have the spirit of bondage. You have the spirit of adoption. You are a son, a daughter of God. You can go to God and, and it's not a, a far away it's not an arm's length relationship. And you can say, oh, sure, he's God, our great heavenly father. No, he's daddy. It is an intimate and it is a close relationship. We are something in Christ. We are special to God. It is not when we say he must increase and I must decrease. It's not that God is seeking to put us down to no, he loves us. He is he has brought us up to be a child of his. But it is important to understand where we are. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit verse 16 that we are children of God. And I love verse 17. And if children than heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We talked out of Romans, right? And we said, it's better to be humble with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. But here we're told that we have an inheritance, that we are in our Father's will that we will receive from him an inheritance, that we are so much a part of the family that we get to partake in its wealth. That's who we are in God. And I think it's important for us to understand that because we're gonna talk about how God is working in our life. And, and, and when we talk about I must decrease and he must increase, that is a function of the spirit working in us, in us. but it's not, it's not God saying you're nothing. It's not God saying you're my slave. It's God saying you're my son, you're my daughter. You're in my will. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're a child of mine and the relationship is intimate. That is who we are and then scripture de de describes for us who we are becoming. We read out of Romans 8 that we're sons, that we're joint heirs. Romans 8 goes on in verse 28 and says this, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You've probably heard that verse before. We love to quote that verse. We love to quote how things are supposed to work for our good. But notice the context of that in verse 29 and 30. It says, for whom he, talking about God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the, the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Listen, God, in, in God's mind, you are fully formed in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to shock you. I don't want to offend you but I don't see it. I, I look at you and go, I, I, don't, I, I might see a little bit of Jesus, but not all of Jesus. And when I look in the mirror, I don't see it either. I don't look in the mirror and go, man, I am just like Jesus. Most of the time when I look at myself, I'm like, I'm not anything like Jesus. I forget the context of it, but I was talking to Cole this week and, and I, I, or maybe it was last week and I said, you know, I know if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit in my life, I would be a class A jerk. And he said, so you're saying you're not? And I, and we got him. He didn't say that. I'm just, he thought it, 
He didn't say. But Romans says you are predestined to be in the image of Jesus Christ. God knows that that, if you know Christ as your savior, that's where you're gonna end up. In a glorified state. I can't even imagine what that would be like. I just think of the physical aspects where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no regret, no, no guilt, no remorse. What a, what a tremendous state that must be. That's how we are going to spend eternity. But he is working circumstances out. All things work together for our good to those who are called according to his purpose. God is working circumstances out to make us more like Jesus. Because in God's eyes, he sees us that way already. He knows where we will end up. And so, in Christ, we are a joint heir, but we are in the process of being formed to be more like Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13 puts it this way. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, for I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And we talked about that in our last series, but those verses are great because it says, you know, I was a child, but then I became a man. And now I am, I, I'm here on the earth and I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to have him increase in my life. I'm trying to have my own desires, my own will to decrease. But one day I will be exactly like him. Now I see dimly, but then I will see face to face. We have amazing technology that we can take advantage of today. My son and daughter-in-law live in Japan and we will often get online and I use my iPad and we'll video chat back and forth and, and it's great. It's great to be able to see them. We have varying levels of connectivity with that. You know, sometimes we're talking and then all of a sudden, maybe you'll still hear them talking but their, their mouth's not moving anymore. Or maybe their words don't match their mouth, that happens sometimes, or then it'll just all go away. I was talking to my son a couple weeks ago and I swear, every time I would ask him a question, he'd go, well, <laughs> and so that's how it's been. And I'd be like, oh, and I told my wife, I was like, I talked to our son for like 20 minutes. Well, what's going on with him? I have no idea. <laughs> really, I mean, that's, I just see, it seemed like someone was playing a trick on me. That's the way the internet was that day. And I'm thankful for the technology, but it's different. Sometimes we'll sit on video chat and we'll, we'll kind of, we'll do this with my daughter at college too. We'll kind of run out of things to talk about. And I've thought about that. And I've thought about how different that is than when they're home. When we're sitting in the living room. We never really run out of things to talk about. It's different, right? Because we're together. And even in our technology, there's a difference from when we're separated to when we're together. And God is working on the process to make us more like his son. And we will see glimpses of it and glimmers of it. There will be times when we will not do what we desire to do, but we will no do what we know God wants us to do. There'll be times when we don't react with our natural flesh, flesh and our natural nature, but we react with a spiritual nature and we can see it, but it's not fully what it will be when we spend forever in eternity in heaven with God. God is making us to be more like his son. We call that process sanctification. The idea that he must increase and I 
must decrease. Very quickly as we close this morning, I want us to look at two passages of scripture. The first in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. It says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. So uh, Paul writing in Romans here says, listen, wake up, pay attention. What I'm saying is urgent. What does he say? Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. And I like the analogy that Paul gives to us. He says, listen, there's something to be taken off and there's something to be put on. We've got to take off our own desires, these fleshly desires, the works of this world, and we've got to put on the armor of light. You have been adopted into God's family. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. God has not given you the spirit of bondage, but of freedom. You are a son. You are a daughter. Look like it. Act like it. Dress like it. Be in that process. How does that happen, you say? When we decrease and he increases in our life. Galatians chapter five, a familiar passage of scripture, but it's interesting the, the contra contrast here. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. He says, look, there's a battle within us and we can give in to the flesh. And, and again, we are not talking this morning about issues of salvation. We're not talking about, I've got to be good enough so that God will love me, so that I can go to heaven. You, listen, that's not the way it works. That's completely backwards. Listen, God loved you because you weren't good enough. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you because you could never be good enough and, and, and pay enough to get to God. So God did for you what you could never do for yourself. God has adopted you into his family, not because you're good enough, because he is holy and loves you. And if you know Christ is your savior, then positionally, that's who you are in Jesus Christ, a son, a daughter of his. So we're not talking about being good so that God will, will give us some favor. We're talking about our response to God's favor. God loves you. He adopted you into his family. He predestined you to be in the image of Jesus Christ. That's how you're gonna spend forever. How are you gonna react? What you should do is love him. Put off. The, the, the works of the flesh. Put on the works of the spirit. The works of the flesh are evident. They show themselves. Their adultery, fornication, sexual sins, their uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, these are the things that we need to be decreasing in our life. I've said this before, but I think sometimes when we get into adulthood, we can grow spiritually complacent. 
Maybe you graduate from college or, or you go out on your own and you think, I'm an adult. Maybe you pass some other milestone in your life. Maybe you have kids or maybe you get to the point where your kids leave the nest. Maybe you even get to retirement. But at some point, we get to a point where we think, I've got it made. And that affects us spiritually. But according to scripture, Our lives ought to be the process of us decreasing and God increasing. Our lives ought to be the process of the works of the flesh becoming less and less evident in our life and the fruits of the Spirit becoming more and more evident in our life. That means I ought to have less jealousies, less outbursts of anger, less fleshly desires, less hatred towards other people. And I ought to have more love, mercy, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. Those things ought to be showing themselves more and more and more in our lives. That means I shouldn't be growing cynical. I shouldn't be growing crotchety. I shouldn't be growing to have a poor attitude. I ought to be growing in the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Galatians says? Isn't that what John said? I mean, John had experienced this great ministry. And when his followers came to him concerned about Jesus, he said, no man can do anything, but it comes from heaven. He must increase and I must decrease. This is the way it's gonna work. And you know what he said in that? Look at verse 29. He said, that brings me joy. That brings me joy. He didn't do, it wasn't begrudging. He wasn't like, well, I guess my time's passed. It was a good run. It was great while it lasted, but now it's the other guy. No. He said, I've got joy. Why? Because God had sent the Messiah. He understood how God was working. He must increase and I must decrease. My challenge to you this morning is this. How do you deal with the success of others? Does it bring you joy? Does it bring you jealousy? How do you deal with God's blessing to those around you? Does that bring you great joy? Or does that sow seeds of bitterness? How about you in your life? If you know Christ as your savior, listen, you are positionally a joint heir with God. In God's mind, in God's eyes, you're fully formed in the image of his son. Are you progressing that way? Would someone that knows you say that you are more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Would someone that knows you say that you are more loving and patient and merciful today than when you were a year ago? Is there less bitterness? Is there less anger? Is there less jealousy? Because that's evidence of the Spirit working in our life. And if that's not the case, then we need to ask ourselves, do we not have the Spirit or are we resisting Him in our life? Now I understand, listen, I understand we we fall back, we deal with struggles. I'm not saying those things. But we ought to be able to see the progression of the Holy Spirit working and shaping us to become more like Jesus. He must increase. I must decrease. Let's bow our head this morning. Maybe you're here this morning And you're not even really sure what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, what it means to have the wrong things in your life forgiven by God and and for him to be in that process of making you to be like his son. Man, this morning, there's nothing uh, more important. There's no greater conversation that we could have than to talk to you about how you can know Christ as your savior. 
Maybe you're here this morning and as, as the word has been preached, you, God has just really spoken to you about some things in your life that you need to make right. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you need to confess. Maybe there's some bitterness that you need to let go of. Maybe you need to ask God to help you to overcome some things that you're struggling with in your life. Maybe today you just need to thank God for who you are in him, for the work that he is doing in your life. I'm gonna pray here in just a moment but as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, there's people that are making their way to the back and right back here uh, behind the coffee bar, uh, we've got a room where some people would love to just meet with you, pray with you about a burden that you're carrying, help you to understand how you could have a relationship with God if that's uh, a question in your mind this morning. But as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, feel free to just stand and make your way to the back. There's some people there that would love to meet you and, and talk with you more about these things. God, I just thank you for your love and for your goodness to us. God, I just pray that you would help us to remember that you desire to each and every day work in our lives to make us more like your son. God, help that to be our morning and our daily prayer that he must increase and I must decrease. We love you and we thank you for your word today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.